In this video, we're going to look at acceleration and the material derivative. The material derivative is used to define the derivative of a quantity following a particle in a flow. Most commonly in fluid mechanics, we use this to define the acceleration at a point when we're looking at a flow in the Eulerian frame of reference, as we are with all of these differential equations. We'll see this used next in the derivation of the Navier-Stokes equations. First, I want to think about a very typical flow that will help motivate the need for the material derivative. If we have the flow in a diffuser, that is a channel whose area is getting larger in the flow direction, if we look at a section 1 and a section 2, and we look at the velocity v1, and we ask the question, what's the velocity v2? We know that the mass flow, by conservation of mass, is constant. m dot 1 is equal to m dot 2, and that's equal to rho a1 v1, and that's equal to rho a2 v2. And since we know that the area has gone up, a2 is greater than a1, that means, therefore, that in order to conserve that mass, v2 must be smaller than v1. And in fact, of course, if the density is constant, then a1 v1 equals a2 v2, and we can solve for v2, and it's v1 times the ratio of the areas. Now why are we looking at this example? Let's say this flow is steady. There are no changes in time. In fact, we made that assumption when we use that form of the conservation of mass, that m1 was equal to m2. Yet, a fluid that is here at v1, even though there are no changes in time, as a particle moves from 1 to 2, it has clearly experienced a deceleration. Yet, if we think of acceleration as the time rate of change of velocity, and there's no changes in time, we might mistakenly think that the acceleration was zero, when clearly we see a deceleration or a negative acceleration moving from 1 to 2. And why? Clearly, there is a spatial component to the acceleration in our Eulerian frame of reference. Here, we're considering the velocities at a point, whereas the material systems that we're following are moving. If we could track this particle between 1 and 2, we would of course see that deceleration. And so, the expression for acceleration in Eulerian frame of reference is a little bit more complicated than what you've been used to up to this point. Let's take a look. In fluid mechanics, or in general, we have a quantity, let's say it's the u component of our velocity, and it can be a function of three spatial dimensions, x, y, and z, and of course it can be a function of time. I've written this with the time first, uh, just because of the way I want it to come out, but of course we can write those variables in, in any order that we want. If I want to take the total derivative, du dt, of this quantity, I have to consider all of these variables. And so using the chain rule of calculus, I can say that the derivative of u with respect to t is the partial derivative of u with respect to t, times, of course, the partial derivative of t with respect to t, which is 1. And I do that just for consistency to show that we move now to the next variable, x. And so we take the derivative of u with respect to x, and here's where we have to use the chain rule. Then we have to say times the, the derivative of x with respect to time. Next, we move on to the following variable, and we take the derivative of u with respect to y. Use the chain rule of calculus to say then the derivative of y with respect to time. And finally, the derivative of u with respect to z, and the derivative of z with respect to t. Now, this was just here for completeness, and of course the derivative of t with respect to t is 1, so we can get rid of that. But what is dx dt? dx dt that is following the position of our particle, our particle changing in x location with time, and dx dt is going to be the u component of its velocity. The derivative of position with respect to time is the velocity. So this is going to be the u component of the velocity. Pop that down there. And likewise, dy dt following my particle is going to be the v component, or the component of the velocity in the y direction. And so I can put that down there. And similarly, dz dt is the w component of the velocity. And of course, putting that after my derivative looks a little bit funny. It's going to be more visually appealing. If I swing that around and put the u, v, and w in front of my derivative, and thus we have defined the material derivative, the derivative following a material particle, and it's given this symbol 
capital D with respect to capital DT. And that's the definition of it there. Let's look at this a little more carefully. Perhaps it's a little confusing looking at the u component of velocity is what we're taking a derivative of, but I could put anything in this. I could take the derivative of any variable, which is a function of these t, x, y, and z, or anything else for that matter. And so let's think about temperature. If I had my same diffuser, and the temperature varied in this system, let's say it was cooler here, and this was a heat exchanger as well as a diffuser, so that it was heating up as it moved to here, then, again, there are no changes in time, and yet the temperature is changing. So as a particle moves from 1 to 2, its temperature would be increasing, and we'd have to see that, in fact, there was uh, that spatial component to the change in the temperature. And so I can carry out the exact same procedure using t as this variable, doing exactly what we did on the previous slide, just applying the chain rule, taking the derivative of this with respect to each of these variables in turn, with respect to t, with respect to x, with respect to y, with respect to z, and of course applying the chain rule of calculus each time. I see again my u, v, and w appearing. I put it in the order that I prefer to see, and I see again that I have this derivative that has a temporal component. If the flow is not steady, it can change purely in time, but there's also this completely spatial component. This is the u-velocity component, the v-velocity component, the w-velocity component, times these spatial derivatives of, in this case, my temperature. So what does that mean for acceleration? Let's look at that next. But first, let's look at the definition of the material derivative. So we've come up with this, we've derived this quantity, which we've given the symbol capital D by capital DT, and we can apply it to any of our variables and it is defined that it has that spatial component, or that temporal component, the derivative of whatever we're taking with respect to time, plus u times the partial derivative with respect to x, the v velocity times the partial respect, derivative with respect to y, w times the partial derivative with respect to z. We can also write that in vector notation, where we introduce our NABLA operator again. We have the partial derivative with respect to time plus the velocity vector dot product taken with this NABLA operator, which is defined as the derivative of whatever we apply it to with respect to x, and that gives us the i component of the vector, the derivative with respect to y, which gives us the j component, and the derivative with respect to z, which gives us the k component. And so we can write this in our nice concise vector notation if we wish to do so. Now I want to look at the acceleration, and again this is the acceleration at a point, think of that point somewhere in our diffuser, and because we're applying the governing equations that should be following our fixed math system, yet we're wanting to write the equations at a point, we need to apply this material derivative. And so the acceleration, probably been most used to saying that that is the derivative of the velocity with respect to time, but because we're now operating them in the Eulerian frame of reference and we're looking at the acceleration at a point following a particle, we actually have to use the material derivative that we've just derived. And that has the temporal component and the spatial component. So that even if there are no changes in time and this term were to go to zero, these are there's still all of these spatial components. So here is our temporal component, and here is our spatial component. And of course, the velocity, the acceleration is a vector quantity. And if we go to a Cartesian coordinate system, where we have our velocity vector with a u component in the i, a v component in the j, and a w component in the k, we can use the <laughs> look at the x component by taking the material derivative of the u component of the velocity and get this expression here for the x component of the acceleration. We can do it with the v component of the velocity and get the y component of the acceleration. And finally, with the w component of the velocity in order to get the z component of the acceleration. So please make sure you don't make that mistake of thinking that even though a flow is steady, there is no acceleration. There is very, very clearly these spatial components to the acceleration that are very important in fluid mechanics.